Uh, good evening. Welcome to December 15th City Commission meeting. If we could rise and salute the flag, please. Which is to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you for coming this evening. Um, uh, could you call the roll, please? Certainly, Mayor. Commissioner Baldini? Here. Commissioner Convenzi? Here. Commissioner Conley? Here. Commissioner Frazier? Here. Commissioner Reynolds? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Campana? Here. Mayor Coyne? Here. Um, the next item is note of any agenda changes. Seeing none. Um, we a motion to approve the agenda would be appropriate. Sure. Um, I just before I make the motion, could I just ask if um, we plan to have any staff discussion on Lakeshore Boulevard? If not, I'd like to make a motion to include discussion on that topic. Is there support to that? We'll support that. Any discussion? Please raise your hand to be recognized. And when you talk, no, no further discussion. All those in favor say aye. We'll make that item. All those opposed, no. We'll make that item number eight on new business. All right. Thank you. Now, you want to make a motion? I'd Sorry. like to make a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Is there support? Sarah? Second. Uh, all right. All those in favor say aye. Yes. Opposed say no. <laughs> uh, announcements. Uh, we have the traditional announcements of vacancies, but I'm really happy to report that since just last week we have four new people who've stepped up to serve and volunteer, and I really appreciate the efforts uh, of their efforts, and some of the commissioners actually asked some people and got people to say yes. So uh, I, that's... Uh, incentive to our new committee to try to work on that uh, because we have many vacancies. Um, <clears throat> I have no announcements. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the first presentation would be Aging Services Advisory Committee. Uh, Mr. Bingham, you have a report? Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Honorable Mayor, City Commissioners, the City Staff, and City Manager. Uh, my name is Stan Begum of uh, 719 Pine Street, Marquette, Michigan. And my associate, Jesse. I'm Jesse Austin, um, 902 Garfield. We would like to um, discuss the City Aging Services Advisory Committee report delivered to you on this day, December 15th. First, I'd like to say thank you for the new Senior Center sign, if you'll see up in the corner there of the, of the presentation, that is a sign outside the Senior Center. It's very nice. We want to thank you for that. I wanted to address the background a little bit of, of the committee and the establishment um, of this committee, which was brought to you on May 28th of uh, 2013. You approved the committee based on a six-member body um, on June 10th of 2013. The six-member body represents um, seniors of interest with the City of Marquette. Uh, the Commission approved three more seats for our Commission October 14th of this year. The structure of those seats are as follows. You can see them up there. The, there are three of the nine are citizens at large. The remaining six are members that represent any of the following categories. One is a senior of, of the city of Marquette, has to be a resident of the city, a professional business person, uh, a banker. We're looking for a Northern Center for Lifelong Learning member, a retired senior volunteer program member, senior provider network, and that could be almost any provider within the city of Marquette. We have a member from the YMCA. We don't have a member of the health care organization, which we are really looking for. We have a member of the home care organization, and we have a senior housing organization member standing right here. The city commission has also approved our 
new mission for this year, 2014, on October. Our meetings are held on the third Monday of the month at 9 a.m., and they're normally in the city hall, room 103. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. We have 12 meetings scheduled. We've had nine meetings so far, and we've had to cancel three due to lack of a quorum. Our background for the members today, uh, Jesse Ralston, who is my associate here, represents the housing seat. Jeff Nyquist, who is the representative of home care, is the CEO of home, UP Home Health and Hospice. Lorraine Thune is our YMCA seat. Colleen Roberts is our citizen at large. Myself, Stan Bigham, um, I'm the sitting chairman of the committee and I represent a citizen at large. And as you can see, we have four vacancies, three of those which are new as of October. And then we have our wonderful staff liaison, Jane Palmer, which we could not do without. We really appreciate her help. Our mission for the Aging Services Advisory Committee is really to serve you and the, and the people with the interests, the long and short-term goals for the citizens of this city regarding aging services issues. Our challenges to date, the, the biggest challenge that we face immediately is that we're working on is our senior millage, which is comes up for a vote next November. The ongoing issue that we that we look at and we've been working on uh, for, for quite some time is the improvement of the existing facility as it stands today. And I've presented to that to you a, a number of times. And the other issue that we're looking at along with that, that same scheme is, there, is the possibility of relocation to a new facility. The s support to the, s to the senior staff, senior millage is something that we are working on. In the next slide, you'll see our, our projected dates that we're trying to um, work with on the senior millage. But the last and, and one of the challenges that we have right now is we need new appointments for our committee. Four more seats. If you'll, this, is, this will give you a kind of an idea of, of our projected dates that we're trying to set for the senior millage uh, before the, the, the actual ballot in uh, next November. As far as um, <coughs> the millage, I'll, I'll leave it at, at that. Let's, if you have questions, I'll be glad to answer them. <coughs> Um, Any questions? Are you, is that the end of your report? Well, thank you for being so brief and concise. And uh, <laughs> um, could you? This may be putting you on the spot a little bit, but the the four vacancies are they under some of those qualifications other than someone in the health care? Are there others like? Yes, sir. There, there's one in particular we're really looking at someone uh, from the city of Marquette that we'd really like to have someone from Duke Life Point on the committee if possible. Okay. We've approached Dr. Norm and he's kind of directed me a few places to to look. We had Dr. Piggott at one time, but he had to move out of town and he is no longer available for our committee. Okay. We would like to have a banker uh, on our committee as well. That would really round off. Uh, you know, maybe a local pharmacist would be good someone that would help us with some other issues. Okay. <laughs> and any, we're always open. We have had one visitor this morning to our meeting, which it was nice to have a visitor and come and listen. Okay. Great. Any questions anyone has? Commissioner Cambenzi? Well, I guess thinking about the senior, the senior millage, I mean, that's collected countywide, is it not? And our... This two, there are two millages. Oh, there's two millages. Yes. Okay. The city, the city one. <coughs> yep. Go ahead. Sorry, we have the city one that would be what we are, you know, working on here specifically to us. There is a county one as well, and our intention is not to go along with the same time that the county millage is on the ballot. We want them on different years, county on one year, city on the other. Uh, otherwise, we feel like it would confuse the voters. Any other, Commissioner Campana? The millage is not a new, it's a renewal, obviously. Yes, sir. And you're not increasing it. It'll be the same, or are you asking for more? 
We don't know that yet. You don't know it yet. You're good. Yes. Okay. It's in the we'll, works. We'll circle back to you on that one. All right. Any Thank other you. questions? I have one other question. Um, if you didn't have the millage, could you do anything at all? I, my feeling is the senior center would probably close. Thank you. Okay. No other questions? Well, thank you very much. Uh, you really do a great job and appreciate your efforts. And hopefully people were listening <clears throat> and uh, they can <laughs> uh, and we can get some other folks to join you because it's very important, especially with the millage coming up, and you really do have some challenges ahead of you. Thank you again. Thank you, Mayor. Thank thank you, you. both. Okay. The next item is um, <clears throat> the Lower Harbor Ore Dock Study Update uh, by George Meister uh, from GEI Consultants. And um, we just spent a little over an hour uh, before this meeting going over their very comprehensive report uh, on the ore dock and quite surprising results and uh, very interesting. And I understand you guys have a video today, too, to show us, right? Yeah, that's right. And welcome. Thank you. Yep. Uh, hi, my name is George Meister. I'm with GEI Consultants. Uh, we're an engineering company right here downtown. We were um, fortunate enough to have the opportunity and be selected to work on the Lower Harbor ore dock uh, condition assessment. And um, for the public meeting, we've prepared a 15-minute um, video that I think uh, summarizes pretty well what we did, what we found out there, and um, conveys that information. So um, I think for uh, sake of simplicity, we'll play it. Um, if anybody has any questions afterwards, we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. The 
the study was conducted, it was requested by the, the city. The city owns the ore dock structure. They would like to see it be developed into some sort of uh, uh, public use, uh, commercial development, uh, something that some developer may have a good idea to make it a better, more um, uh, usable part of the, the community. So to facilitate doing that, the city would like to know what they own, you know, what condition it's in, um, does it need any maintenance? What sort of things have to be done to it if someone came in and wanted to develop it? Um, uh, so basically, just do a condition assessment of the structure, find out you know what needs to be done to it or what condition it's in now. So the city of Marquette has had a lot of interest in the ORDOP over the past uh, several years in repurposing it, it for different uses. Um, some of those have been commercial, residential, um, condominiums. Um, the city has uh, had some interest in potentially putting pedestrian access around the ore dock. Um, in order to do that, uh, the ore dock has to be physically fit, sound, and stable to have people on there for safety purposes and uh, for structural stability of anything that's going to be on it. Um, so the city has hired consultants, GEI, to assess the current condition and structural stability of the ore dock. So there was um, the field inspections that were done on the, on the project consisted of basically two inspection teams. Uh, there was an underwater inspection and a superstructure inspection. The work was done, of course, with safety fully in mind. Uh, the underwater inspection was done by a three-person dive team, one diver, one standby uh, tender diver, and then an, uh, a supervisor. Uh, that team would, it was made up of structural engineers that were certified for diving and met OSHA compliance requirements. They were able to check out the bathymetry surveys, check out where the bottom is relative to where everyone thought the bottom is, uh, what the condition of the piles were, um, and the underside of the pile caps, the concrete that, the, that the, is sitting on top of the piles. We had divers inspect the substructure of the ore dock, everything underneath the water. They use sonar to uh, produce an accurate bath bathymetric map of the um, surface underwater. Um, they physically and visually inspected the piles that they could get to. There's approximately 7,600 piles in the ore dock or supporting it. So it's uh, quite a task to be able to get to all of them, but they were able to get a representative sample. Uh, they took cores of some of the piles to determine uh, what they what kind of wood they were, if we could, um, also what kind of condition they were in. They inspected three different things. They, they checked the bottom of the, the lake, the lake bottom basically, to find out whether or not it was at a level that was uh, where the design drawings expected it to be. And basically they found that the, it was infilled by about three to seven feet from the original um, design. So it has silted in over time. Um, the piles, they were able to do visual inspection of all the piles, and for the most part, the piles were in really good condition. Some of them were split. Um, very, very few of them were damaged uh, around the perimeter. Some of them were had some erosion due to most likely ice, uh, but the interior piles were, were in good shape. Um, their connection, the piles connection to the pile cap, which is where the, the wood piles go into the concrete structure, that was all in good shape. The concrete was in good condition. There was some deterioration of the pile gap around the perimeter of the, the structure, again, due to probably ice damage and just smalling, just concrete deterioration in general. Uh, the piles themselves, they varied from about 10 to 16 inches in diameter. Since it's uh, fresh water, there's no bugs, basically, that, that like to chew up the wood. Um, you know, in, the, in, in, in an ocean environment, that would be different. That wood would be all chewed up by bugs. And Lake Superior would last forever. One of the really telling ways that uh, the dive, diver showed me that the, the, the piles were in good condition was they took their dive uh, knife and stabbed the, uh, the piles and took video of that. And that was very clear evidence to me that showed the wood was in great shape. It wasn't um, punky in any way. It was solid wood. Uh, so the divers basically found that the piles were in great condition were at spacings that were very similar or exactly matched the design drawings and, and things were in good shape. 
for superstructure inspections, we visually inspected the entire structure. Um, going through the bottom part wasn't too challenging. We were able to um, physically traverse it with uh, too much difficulty. However, there's no access to the top of the ore dock. So in order to get up there and inspect it, we use rope access techniques. Um, there's no stairs or uh, any other means to get up to it, no ladders or anything up there. And it's uh, about 86 feet above the water surface. Um, so using the rope access, we were able to um, get a team of technicians and engineers up onto the um, superstructure of the ore dock and inspect the chutes and the gates and um, the pockets and bin walls and get a really good idea as to what's going on and what kind of shape it's all in. Um, we also um, thoroughly documented it with photographs and field notes uh, depicting everywhere we found potential distressed areas or uh, any, any potential concerns. The structure is uh, 86 feet tall and 66 feet wide and you know, almost a thousand feet long. So getting up onto the superstructure was challenging, uh, posed a lot of safety risks, and we used rope access techniques, which uh, consists of uh, two safety lines, a primary line to climb on or descend on, and a backup line in case your primary line failed. Um, and we did that inspection with a three-person inspection team that was certified in rope access techniques. And, um, so we got to climb all over the structure and got to see parts of the structure and views that most everyone doesn't get to see. So it was it was quite an enjoyable inspection. Generally speaking, the structure is in really good shape. Um, you know, it, it's structurally sound overall. There are some areas of concern. Um, some of the things that were commonly noted throughout the inspection were areas of spalled concrete or delaminated concrete. Primarily reinforced concrete. That's what you see when you look out at the structure. Is, is mostly reinforced concrete with a little bit of um, riveted steel hanging off of it. When you go around and you check out the, the, the concrete structure, uh, the biggest thing that you see as far as deterioration is uh, spalling of the concrete surface. And what spalling is, is um, the surface of the concrete popping off and water has gotten back to the reinforcement, corroded the reinforcement. That's, that's all over the structure here and there. It doesn't necessarily represent a structural deficiency, although if left unchecked, it, it could. Things we were really trying to look for in the, in the concrete structure that would tell us whether or not there was a problem or not is any sort of differential movements between the eight sections. If they moved independently, you'd be able to see that at the top of the joint it might be fatter or wider uh, than the bottom of the joint. That would indicate differential movement or other offset in some way. Uh, we didn't see any of that in each of the sections. <coughs> As the sections moved a lot, we would see cracking in that. We didn't see any cracking in any of that the concrete elements. So the, the concrete was really sound with no evidence of any structural distress. Um, there is some section loss on the piles, but nothing real significant overall. Um, the, the areas that um, did have concern were localized and, and small, not, um, not anything major over the structure. The chutes were in really good shape. All the metal was uh, generally in great shape, the paint was in good condition and holding up well. The braided cables that support the chutes were also in great shape. Um, some of them still had some of the original grease on them from about 30, 40 years ago when they were last uh, maintained. There was some, some minor cracking uh, noticed throughout the structure, uh, however it's to be expected on a concrete structure of this, this age and this type of use. So the corrosion is really minor on the steel elements, there's really no distress within the steel, all the steel embeds into the concrete were observed to be in good shape. So we believe that the, the structure is suitable for potential repurposing and reuse um, given several different scenarios. Um, our recommendations moving forward on the project are essentially three different things. Um, there's a do-nothing approach which uh, lets the ore dock sit in its current state and continue to slowly deteriorate as it is. The second one is providing public access onto the ore dock or doing the minimal amount of cleanup required and repair, which would be scaling off the loose concrete, some patchwork, some clean of um, brush and soil and some of the vegetation that's growing on it. The 
other option is potential commercial residential development, really using it for something new in the future. Um, moving forward, though, at, at a minimum, if the city wants to potentially reuse it or keep it in a useful condition, it should be um, taken care of, and then there should be a regular maintenance plan put in place to go and inspect it every five years and uh, make sure everything's in good shape. Limited maintenance is, is probably the best way to take our recommendations. Um, the structure is reliable for the long term, however, a little bit of maintenance will make sure that no further deterioration of the structure occurs. That maintenance would consist primarily of, uh, of removing soil from the, the shoots. Um, soil in the shoots will deteriorate those shoots quicker, so getting rid of that would be a good idea. Um, <clears throat> maintaining the critical supporting elements of the chutes uh, themselves, the, the hoist, the steel belts, the connections, the pins, making sure that all those are reliable so there's no risk of those things falling would be a good idea. Alright, so that's, uh, that's our video. Hopefully it was somewhat entertaining and uh, informative. And um, if you have any questions, Mike Carpenter, our uh, senior engineer and branch manager here at Marquette, is, is also available. Uh, so. Okay, well thank you for a great <clears throat> video. Uh, I wanted to make a comment. You and I had talked. Uh, the overhead flyover things of the, vi of the uh, ORDOC were done by a drone, right, and a Go GoPro camera. Uh, or a similar one. Right. Uh, fantastic. Uh, great video. Just a couple little things that I took away from your your report this afternoon uh, was something very disappointing to me. I wanted to know if there were a lot of fish underneath there. And you, the report is they saw one crayfish. That's all. <laughs> and we're sticking to that. What? <laughs> what? I said we're sticking. We're sticking to that. Well, I, I don't. I don't believe them. But uh, and the other thing is, on the bottom, underneath the chutes, there was three to seven feet of iron ore pellets that had spilled over the years on the bottom of the lake. And the other is the piles are fifty or sixty feet long. The pilings. That's correct. That's, and they are probably embedded down in bedrock. So those are things, and I'm just excited to know it's not going to fall apart tomorrow, that it's uh, good. Any comments or questions? Commissioner Cambenzi? Thinking back to why um, the commission initially wanted this study done, and I think at the time uh, one of my main concerns was seeing the low <coughs> lake level and the pilings that were becoming exposed below uh, the concrete there. Should that happen again? I know the lake level within a year is up about 18 inches. Should it go back down? What is a remedy for that? Is it wrapping it? Is it, um, you know, I know as soon as they're kind of exposed to air, it provides a deterioration quite quick. So I don't know if you've thought about that, but that was something I think initially as a commission we talked about. That is, that is something I was not aware of as far as the elevation of the lake exposing the top of the piles. We didn't see any evidence of any sort of deterioration on the top of the piles that would be related to that. Um, so my guess is it's probably not frequent enough to lead to any deterioration. So we didn't see anything that would warrant any sort of mitigation if lower lake levels uh, occurred in the future. That said, that's, that's something to consider for the long term. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Campana. Uh, just for some information, um, and maybe the city manager would want to answer this, is there any sort of a timeline deadline to do something with the ORDOC? Or are we required to do something within a period of time? Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> well, at this time, we don't have any plans uh, in place uh, to do anything per se with it. We have a standing agreement and I'll have to ask uh, maybe for follow-up 
uh, with the exact timeline. I think we have 17 years left since the uh, uh, within the original agreement that we signed. Uh, where we can contemplate doing different things to it. I know the current agreement is very restrictive. Uh, we're not allowed to use it in any manner other than what the existing footprint of the um, of the structure looks like. So I know there have been variously through different times suggestions that we could put finger docks off the side. Uh, that's not allowed because that would change the footprint. There were suggestions that we could uh, construct new things uh, other than just a simple platform on the inside of the building, and that's not permitted. Putting any kind of uh, uh, fixed um, sewer, water, that kind of infrastructure, those kind of improvements uh, aren't currently permitted under the existing agreement. Uh, it's my understanding from speaking with uh, DNR and DEQ that we can always ask to reopen the agreement should a good idea come along. And uh, to Commissioner Cambenzi's point, I can recall uh, within the last couple of years, apart from what I know have been very public discussions uh, of uh, what private interests would like to see done, uh, there was at one point a serious interest in extending the boardwalk around to the end of the ORDOC. And I believe our initial engineering estimate was uh, that that would run somewhere in the neighborhood of $1.5 to $2 million just to, to put the dock back in a a state where it was like the boardwalk, where it had lights on it so we could ensure people's security uh, after hours in the dark uh, with railings and things like that. So uh, to the best of my knowledge, there's no mandate to do anything with the dock. Uh, there have only been a very few ideas that the commission has actually considered about doing something with the dock. And um, I think I was captured well by GEI. Uh, they're really looking at establishing a baseline assessment so that should the city wish to go back and renegotiate with the state or negotiate with some future developer, we absolutely understand what the baseline of the structure is now so we can make some informed judgments later. Any other? Commissioner uh, Frazier. Uh, uh, you said it's obviously in pretty good shape, but with some work, do you think it could be open to the public, like for restricted tours, like kind of like you do mine tours and so forth? So like the, if the Maritime Museum, for say, wanted to do, they do restricted tours of the lighthouse. If they wanted to, say, the city got a grant or they were able to, to fix it up, do some minor work to it around the outside loop, maybe open up to restricted access for like tours or something like that, would that be possible? Yeah, I think the main concern is falling hazards from concrete on the superstructure debris that's uh, up overhead. Um, some of that's in, in degrading condition, and if that was cleaned off um, and um, some of the vegetation cleared off around the outside of the ore dock, I, I think that'd be possible. Um, I'm not sure what the rules would be as far as you know, handrails and, and accessibility and such, but um, there's certainly potential. Commissioner Baldini. I think for the sake of the public, in the executive summary that they prepared for us, they provided a um, engineer's opinion of cost for some things, and that comes to about $800,000, and they do say that it would require further investigation if you wanted to do some of these things. It, uh, you know, the, the option of doing nothing is really not an option at some point because sometime in the future it's going to we could have some other hazards and it's become a part of us how we fund this um, or do something with it uh, is obviously not available funds in our budget um, I don't know if the state is that all interested it's a historical thing and it's quite uh, the engineering thing but uh, uh, it, it's a huge undertaking, and uh, and as they've indicated in our earlier session, uh, concrete does fall, and if we had people walking out there, we would obviously uh, be uh, liable for anything in that situation. So, any other comments? Well, gentlemen, Mike and George, thank you very much. Uh, you seem to really enjoy this project. Uh, it was a challenge for engineers, and we did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Super, super video. Appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> okay.
Moving on to uh, the next item on the agenda is number three, boards and committees. Uh, is there a motion to reappoint Jeremy Hansen to the Downtown Development Authority for a term ending January 1st, 2019? Commissioner Reynolds. I move we reappoint Jeremy Hansen to the Downtown Development Authority for a term ending January 1st, 2019. Commissioner Campana. I second that. All, any discussion? No discussion. Okay. All those in favor say yes of the motion reappointing Jeremy Hansen to the DDA uh, for term ending January 1st, 2019. Please say yes. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. That passes unanimously. Now is the time for public comment. Public comment is limited to three minutes. Um, the red light. Uh, the green light will go on when you start talking, and uh, then and when there's one minute, the yellow light will go on, and it'll start blinking at 30 seconds, and then the red light, your time is up. Please state your name, uh, physical residence, and the city or township in which you reside. Uh, please come forward if you'd like to speak, or if you'd like to reserve time, or be available for an agenda item to answer questions. <clears throat> Bob Kimbenzi, 306 North 6th Street, City of Marquette. I'd like to, first of all, reserve time for item number seven. And uh, secondly, I had a bunch of comments on the ore dock. I wish you wouldn't let them run out the door. At least I would like for them to hear it. Number one, I ask that you put their report on the city website. I think it would be uh, pretty informative to quite a few of the people. And also, maybe if you could have uh, something on the website about what that agreement is with the state of Michigan, because I know when there was a developer here three or four years ago with an idea, but there's, as the manager said, some severe restrictions on what you can do with that thing. And really, you know, the reality is it's kind of a dinosaur or an albatross or whatever you want to call it. Um, to think of throwing money into that thing just to kind of keep it from deteriorating is kind of kind of a crazy thought because it's going to take a lot of money just to kind of keep it in shape. Um, one of the thoughts that I've heard before and I thought of myself, you know, what would it cost a lot of money again for partial demolition to take the top off of that thing? So that basically what you were left with was a pier or a dock that would be whatever that bottom part is, four or five or six feet above the water. Then it would be a nice long, almost quarter long, quarter mile long flat surface, um, which would lend itself to a number of, you know, small little uh, uses, developments, commercial type developments. Um, probably would something would work out for that, but the cost of demolishing the top of it, again, would be tremendous. You know, I think when the railroad gave the rail, rail yard or sold the rail yard to the city of Marquette, they probably ran out of town laughing that they got you to take the ore dock too because it just, it really is a, um, you know, it's an albatross. And I, whether anything could be developed with a private development that would work out with that thing, it's really questionable. I almost believe that you probably, you know, unless you could come up with some kind of big grant with good old tax dollars again from somewhere to help that out or make it work, it's probably not economically feasible. So that's my comments. Thank you. Thank Jeff Ferro, 350 East Ridge Marquette, to speak on items six and seven. These are my opinions. December 8th, two rowers incorrectly accused me of changing my mind about their boathouse. Yes, I'd recommended the site many times, but never their proposal. From the first sight of their top view drawing, I opposed the huge size, the impact around the building, <coughs> and the small amount of percentage for public use. Bells and whistles sounded. Even worse, they refused to provide the requested perspective drawings as if, if, if they sought to keep us from seeing their design ahead of your vote and they're still withholding the front perspective showing the garage doors. 
The Roars also accused us of misrepresenting their project to our benefit. I've always mentioned the measly 15% of public use. They're misrepresenting us as if we're saying it's all private and as, as if we're denying accessibility to the beach when in truth any plan would accommodate wheelchairs. They only referred to my quotes which benefited them after I detailed the reasons behind my rationale minutes earlier. It's as though they'd heard nary a word. They'd written their comments ahead of time, thus were unable to revise them at the last moment. Of course, the public record spells out the total truth, as does Niger's website, SaveFoundersLandingBeach.com. What exactly are they accusing him and me of hiding, all while they hid the perspective drawings from all of us? The attributes they spoke of are just as achievable at Cinder Pond as at the current site. Had they been willing to reduce the size, build deeper into the slope, improve the exterior design, and not impact so much land around the structure, I'd still have supported the current site up to December 8th anyway. It's become apparent that their leadership so bends the truth, we must not entrust them with a foot of our shoreline. An example is their correct statement that I dedicated effort to the site, but never to that plan or to the design that they hid from us until after your fateful, uninformed vote. We've also learned that the beach means a lot to many people, so I'm willing to fight for them despite my elation that you were forced to rescind your insane decision on the wooded site though be it under the threat of a lawsuit. Their statement that I fought for the site and now circulate a petition is irrelevant. Why not let the voters decide? The process is called democracy, which wasn't upheld, especially by Campana, for not recusing himself, allegedly because five votes were needed to force the item through. This despite how secretive the club was about their industrial design, which is incompatible with our lakeshore. This is the controversy you create by voting without the needed information which you were, you were advised to obtain in advance. Again, we're paying for your refusal to listen. As Ishpemin Council Member Tall said, the people run us, we don't run the people. A little of that would go a long way around here. My name, my name is Bill Spedden, and I reside at 1605 Wright Street in the city of Marquette. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and Commissioners, for the opportunity to speak tonight. I would also like to thank everyone that works to make the city of Marquette the great community that it is. Tonight, I am representing myself and also speaking on a group known as the Muffin Runners that regularly utilize the city multi-loose multi-use paths and have run the loop that includes the lakeshore for over five years every Wednesday morning rain shine snow I've had several contacts with city staff over the last month regarding the status of the section of the path adjacent to Lakeshore Boulevard that was closed due to the November storm <clears throat> my first call to Public Works Department was referred to mr. Whitney who was on TV6 News later that day, and it was he that responded to my inquiry. The latest announcement by the city was expressed to the public by Mr. Stackowitz on TV6 News last Thursday as follows, that the continued closure of the entire area was due to, quote, hazards under the snow, unquote, and plowing, quote, would be creating an attractive nuisance, unquote. Because of this, I come before you tonight to ask the city commission to direct the city manager to have the Lakeshore Boulevard section of this path to be cleared of snow and any incidental debris left by the storm without delay and continue to plow that section regularly as is done on the rest of the path system in the city. I would like to make a few supportive statements in this regard. One, I do not see any visible damage to the multi-use path nor any unusual hazards to safety. I walked it today end to end and I see no damage at all. Two, since the road was closed after the storm, the road and path have been used by hundreds, if not thousands of people, walking, running, and biking. Three, the area is now actually safer for pedestrians because there is not any adjacent vehicular traffic. Four, plowing the multi-use path will provide the safest route for pedestrians who are using the connecting paths that are being plowed. Five, in the event of a significant snowfall that provides a barrier to pedestrian traffic along the stretch, 
The alternative route for walkers, runners, bikers, parents with strollers, dog walkers, etc., would be to follow the detour route posted for vehicular traffic. This would result in pedestrians using both sides of Wright Street, which has no sidewalks or paths, only a gravel shoulder, which may not be snow free, and Presque Isle Avenue, of which the existing sidewalks are not being cleared of snow by the city. Therefore, pedestrians would be forced to utilize the roadway for, uh, for both of these busy streets. In essence, plowing the multi-use path along Lakeshore Boulevard will act to improve the safety of the many people who regularly use the city paths. I want to thank you for your attention and consideration in addressing this matter. Um, I understand that it's added as item eight, and I will remain here for questions or uh, any other comments um, if desired. Um, I apologize for reading. Thank you. Your time's up. Thank you. Didn't see. That's why. And you'll be available for questions. So you have to give that to the clerk. Hi, um, Ed Bannis, uh, 107 uh, Lakeshore Drive in Marquette. Um, I'm the CEO of Upper Peninsula Health System Marquette, and I'm available for any uh, questions for item number seven. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Nina Vandenden. I reside at 3032 Island Beach Road. It used to be Lakeshore Boulevard, but it's changed. Um, I just am here in support of um, Bill Sved and opening that area on the, the bike path on Lakeshore there. I use it as well. Every time I'm out there, I, I see other people using it. And it's just, it's, we tried running on Presque Isle, and it was really unsafe the day we did that. Um, the sidewalks aren't always plowed there, and we're going to get more snow. Right now, the bike path, as far as getting through there, is okay but it's going to get worse and we just like to see we don't really care so much about the road i know that's a whole nother issue but just the bike path itself would be wonderful to be able to get through there thank you thank you anyone else wishing to speak seeing no one else i'm going to close the public comment section and we move on to the consent agenda is there a motion to approve the consent agenda commissioner Connolly? I move to, uh, that uh, we pass the consent agenda. Sure, support. Commissioner Reynolds? Second. Commissioner Connolly, any comments? Commissioner Reynolds, any comments? No. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say yes. 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 Opposed? Okay. That, that motion passes. <clears throat> Next is new business. Uh, the f item number five is the water filtration excuse me, water filtration membrane replacement. Madam Clerk, could you read the recommendation? Thank you, Mayor. Background, the market water filtration plant <coughs> utilizes membrane technology for water treatment. Replacement of 720 membranes has been approved in the fiscal year 14-15 budget. The <coughs> membranes being replaced are proprietary with only one manufacturer able to produce, provide the membranes. The Director of Public Works and Utilities with the assistance of Fishbeck Thompson, Karen Hubert, has reviewed the proposal and provided a detailed recommendation letter. With the background of the City of Marquette water filtration operational process utilizing membrane technology. A quote was originally obtained from Evoca Water Technologies in August with an expiration date of September 15th. Attached with the letter of recommendation is an updated confirmation from Evoca in the amount of $829,544. Fiscal effect, $1.1 million has been approved in the fiscal year 1415 capital outlay budget. Recommendation for the reasons stated above, determine that there is no advantage to competitive bidding and authorize the city to enter into an agreement with Evoqua Water Technologies LLC for a not to exceed amount of $829,544 for the purchase and installation of replacement membranes. Alternatives as determined by the Commission. Thank you. Commissioners, what is your pleasure? Commissioner Goldini. I have a question. Is this two motions or one? One. one. That we have to authorize to do a no bid? and No, no, oh, it's okay. one motion. You. You'd like to make a motion? Yes, I will. All right. So. <laughs> All right. 
Uh, is there a support to that? Uh, so move what? You have to state what the motion is yeah. here. Uh, the mo yes. Uh, uh, I authorize the city to enter into an agreement uh, not to exceed $829,544 for the purpose of installation of replacement membranes. Uh, would you add that there's no competitive advantage to bidding to that motion? Be happy to do that. Okay. Also, please be noted that there is no advantage to competitive bidding in this matter. And it's also for the purchase and installation. Yes. Right. yes. Okay. Okay. Is there a support to that, Mr. Fraser? No Mr. Baldini, any comments? I, I think the background material we received is quite ex uh, explains in great detail. Uh, the uniqueness of this and uh, that there's nobody else who can really provide it for us at this point. So, Commissioner Frazier, any further comments? No. Nope. Uh, just a comment to Mr. Goodman. Uh, good job. Uh, you were able to negotiate a substantial reduction to the expected bid and appreciate that very much. So good job. Uh, any other comments? See? Oh, excuse me. Commissioner Campana. I'd just like to add that Mr. Goodman's staff did a very good job of um, getting the most life out of the current set of membranes. So, you know, it, it, we're glad that uh, they're able to do that and it helps the city. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no further questions, uh, call the motion for uh, the motion. Uh, since there is no advantage to competitive bidding and authorizing the city to enter into an agreement with Evaqua Water Technologies LLC not to exceed the amount of $829,544 for the purchase and installation of replacement membranes. All those in favor of that motion, please say yes. 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 All opposed? No. That motion carries unanimously. The next is item number six, uh, Cinder Pond Marina Professional Services Agreement. Madam Clerk, could you read that, please? Thank you, Mayor. Background. Staff solicited competitive sealed bids for engineering and architectu architectural design services for the design and construction administration of the Cinder Pond Marina Harbor Service Building. Proposals were due November 10, 2014. Scope and work included soil borings, wooding foundation design, facility design, as-built drawings, obtaining all permitting, construction management, and preparation in three public for uh, participation in three public forums. The city received five sealed proposals, Northern Design Works, Mayefsky Architects, UP Engineering and Architects, CWE Inc., IDI Architecture Engineering Consultants. Staff reviewed all proposals and recommends Mayefsky Architects based upon providing a complete proposal including acquiring all regulatory permits, previous experience with similar projects, understanding complexity of the footing foundation work, and quality of applicable design work. The city's existing insurance claim will only pay a portion of the professional services or approximately $3,170 for construction administration. The balance or $31,800 will be paid through the Cinder Pond Marina Fund retained earnings. Upon awarding the project, staff will begin to work with the consultant on initial design and permitting. The design concepts will be vetted to the community at three public forums. Bidding will occur in March with construction estimated to begin in May 2015. Fiscal effect. Engineering and architectural design and construction administration will be paid by the existing MML liability and insurance pool claim and Cinder Pond Marina Fund. Recommendation. Approve the proposal from Mayefsky Architects of Marquette, Michigan, totaling $34,970 to provide engineering and architectural design services and construction administration for the Cinder Pond Marina Harbor Service Building and direct the city attorney to draft the professional service agreement. Alternatives as directed by the commission. Thank you. Mr. Verito, you wish to speak on this uh, agenda item? Frank Jeff Barreto, 350 East Ridge Marquette. These are my opinions. You're ahead of yourselves again by moving too far along with a new cinder pond building, not knowing the outcome of the boathouse matter. You've heard requests to study the viability of incorporating two boat-related facilities into a single footprint, or incorporate the recommendations as detailed <coughs> on record for the approved boathouse site, and at that time present the cinder pond proposal under discussion tonight. 
Constructing a larger building at the marina seems achievable by using additional space just west of the proposed structure and moving the parking just west of that. A new protected dock for the rowers would extend just south of the south pilings as previously mentioned. To prove my lack of bias, I'd be the one looking down at the larger building from my home, unlike the rower's current location. It's far more efficient to incorporate two related uses into the same building or parcel than to scatter a different building for each entity along our entire, or at least more of our public lakeshore. You have asked to proceed no further on your professional service agreement until we either instruct an architect to incorporate the facilities into one or derive at a more responsible plan to build a better designed boathouse at the current spot. In the latter case, we'd accept bids for the proposal as detailed in tonight's supplement. If you proceed now anyway, then don't cry later that there's no place to put a boathouse should we gather enough signatures to give our citizens their due right to determine the best use of our own public beach. To ignore these suggestions may result in your discarding yet another potentially optimal land use possibility. Commissioners, uh, what's your pleasure on this item? Commissioner Connolly. <coughs> I move that we approve the proposal <coughs> from Mayeski Architects of Market, Michigan, totaling $34,970 to provide engineering and architectural design services and construction administration for the Cinder Pond Marina Harbor Service Building and direct the city attorney to draft the professional, professional service agreement. Thank you. Is there support to that? Commissioner Campana. Support. Commissioner Connolly. Well, there's been concern uh, among boaters that uh, this project was uh, moving ahead uh, without them. And uh, I'd like to point out that this proposal uh, calls for three public forums for their input, which we very much value. Uh, we think that uh, uh, some of the things that have been incorporated in past marinas and other marinas uh, uh, have, that haven't worked out so well will be pointed out by the boaters and they'll have input in, into the design. We'll have a better building. This may be an opportunity rather than a uh, problem. Commissioner Campana. I am glad to see this project finally move, or moving forward. <clears throat> I'm looking at these five engineering firms, and I'm sure they're all very good, very capable. I'm glad we're picking one from Marquette. I'm going to ask the question I probably know the answer to, but they do. One engineering firm or design firm here appears to be $11,000 cheaper than the one we're going to pick. The reason for that is? Who, who do you wish to ask? Uh, staff. Staff? Well, I'm, I was certain you were going to ask that question. Um, <laughs> and, that's a, and that's an excellent question. The, uh, the, the, the Majewski, as well as the, the other higher-priced uh, architects and engineering architecture firms, they included uh, permitting, which was a requirement of, under the, uh, the RFP itself. Um, the lower price or the lower, the lower cost uh, bid did not. Um, we see this as being a pretty, a, pretty much a complex project just due to the footings and foundation uh, work that will need to be done. We, um, the uh, one that the or the Majewski uh, proposal, I think, demonstrates a clear understanding of that complexity uh, with their strategy to get it done. Um, so um, we're f fully confident in Majewski's ability to get the uh, get the project completed on time. I have one more question, though. Okay. Uh, the existing insurance claim will only pay a portion of $3,170, which is about a tenth of the total bill. Why doesn't it pay at all, city manager? Actually, thank you, Your Honor. I'm going to ask Carl to just keep going. He's doing such a great job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, the the answer that we received is it's really the city's responsibility um, to do the geotech work, the soil borings, these types of things. Uh, anything that's up and beyond what was uh, uh, previously there in, in their opinion, our insurance uh, carrier's opinion, is we already have bid documents for an existing building. 
what we're looking at is that it's uh, most likely will be somewhat different uh, at the very least programming within the building they're not willing to uh, to pay for anything new up and beyond what would have made us whole if that makes sense um, and that it's the city's responsibility to pay for anything up and beyond that in terms of the construction costs um, that's not something we do um, we don't oversee um, construction of buildings um, and because of that reason uh, they're willing to, to pick up that portion of the proposal sure this is it and in defense of the roll club um, the proposal to put the boathouse at the marina site um, was talked about and it's not safe there's a safety factor in that it's not safe to put their boats in there and it's um, just launching them from that area it would be very difficult because of the dropping grade so they looked at that site but it just it would not possibly at all work out they have determined the best spot is still uh, down by the Hampton Inn thank you Commissioner Kimbenzi well, I'd like to thank Commissioner Campana for asking those questions um, pretty much answered a lot of mine but I I would like to say um, on our citizen comment about putting the storage of the the rowing boats there um, I do think the community uh, doesn't feel that the past Commission chose the right site I do think that when you look at most boats they don't launch on a sandy beach they launch off a dock and in fact um, Northern does it now. I think if you look on any major river around the world, that's how people launch. Um, so I would like to actually agree um, that this was a better site. When you drive by the current site that was picked for the boathouse now, I there's no doubt in my mind you can't put a boathouse on that site. There, the land, since the water level has risen 18 inches, I think will make it a mute point so um, I'm going to disagree I do think that for the long term for the city's financial liability and in, in taking ownership of a building like that I think it would be more fiscally prudent to look at storing those boats with the marina um, and having a launch site over there so those are my comments thank you Any other comments uh, I have a comment excuse me I, I want to talk okay. Um, I disagree my opinion is doesn't fit with the community doesn't feel like the previous Commission I I don't know how you can make that statement I don't feel the community feels that way other people on the Commission may feel that way but that doesn't translate to the community feels that way uh, similarly uh, we had a work session where I think it's important to point out that the City Commission said we would like to consider putting it at the marina not the rowing club we decided let's look at that because of the very reasons of cost and convenience and we learned that being not I'm not a rower but I am a sailor and I know sometimes getting out of the marine of the cinder pond marina in a sailboat is very difficult because of the wind and the waves and the fetch coming from South Marquette and if you're in a little 60-foot uh, rowing thing with about that much freeboard you'd be full of water by the time you got out of the out of the harbor so it's not uh, it's just not feasible we looked at it we had a work session where that was thoroughly discussed and dismissed so it's we're not being irresponsible at all we we did look at that because of that very reason and it won't work in my opinion and I'm not going to be so bold as to say the community doesn't feel that way it's just the people who are responsible by an elected process to make a decision they made that decision based on a discussion so any further comments Commissioner Connolly well, I row, but I'm not a member of the Community Rowing Club and, and have not been. Um, <clears> that would be a really tough place to launch a, row, a rowing shell from, in my opinion. It's one of the toughest places along the Lake Superior Shore. Um, so I, I, I just couldn't see that that would be a practical solution. Any other comments? Mr. Frazier. Um, I do row and I do powerboat too, so I, I you know. I think some of the power boats have trouble getting out of that marina. 
you know, unless it's a canoe or a kayak or something like that. And I think being down in the marina and seeing some of the docking that some people do would be a danger to the kayakers, if anything else. Um, not to mention the, you know, the boaters pay a fee to the marina and to the city to use those facilities and to have a, you know, unless there is another part, but, you know, I know the insurance before Raleigh really covered to rebuild the building as it was or something like that, and there's just a little bit of public space for the boaters, so to have public space for storage for the boats just would be, you know, maybe kind of unfair to the boaters or something, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, Commissioner Kambenzi? I'd like to change my comment to not the entire community, but I would say a good majority. And for me, um, I don't think we were looking at launching a 60-foot boat out of the marina. We were actually looking at putting a launch site um, right near the parking lot um, off the side of, of the, the pier there. So to me, I still think it wasn't a bad decision. Um, again, you know, you've got a 60-foot boat that's less than a foot off the water in Lake Superior. I think you know, if if there's only a very specific place that can launch, my question to further this along is maybe it shouldn't be in Lake Superior. But again, that's not what this conversation is about. But I would like to say that I believe the majority of the community <clears throat> doesn't like our decision. Any further comments? I stand by my comments. My opinion is there is no way to judge the majority. And uh, we're responsible for doing this, and that's what we're doing. So I'll call the question. Appro uh, the motion was to approve the proposal from Myeski Architects of Market, Michigan, totaling $34,970 to provide engineering and architectural design services and construction administration for the Cinder Pond Marina Harbor Service Building and direct the city manager to draft the professional service agreement. All those in favor, please say yes. Yes, yes. Yes. Opposed. Okay, that motion passes unanimously. We move now to item number seven, uh, reimbursement agreement for Duke Life Point General. Excuse me, Duke, Duke Life Point Marquette General Replacement Hospital. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you read the agenda item, please? Thank you, Mayor. Background: The Marquette Brownfield Redevelopment Authority has drafted a reimbursement agreement between the city. The Marquette Brownfield Redevelopment Authority, Life Point Hospitals Inc., and Duke Life Point Market General Hospital LLC for the DLP Market General Replacement Hospital project, including infrastructure and relocation of the City Municipal Service Center. The City is a party to the reimbursement agreement since Brownfield tax increment financing revenues will reimburse the bond payments for public infrastructure. Life Point Hospitals Inc. Inc. is proposed as a signatory to assure the financial obligations for bond payments. The standard form of the MBRA reimbursement agreement has been revised to incorporate provisions of the memory, Memorandum of Understanding. These provisions include the PA 255 tax abatement, coverage for revenue shortfalls for the city bond up to $20 million, assurance of bond payment coverage in the case of tax exempt status for the MGRH up to a city bond amount of $20 million, condition of a property purchase precedent to the public improvements bonding, condition of a tax appeal dismissal precedent to the public improvements bonding. In addition, the reimbursement agreement includes a condition of an executed development agreement between the developer and the city of Marquette for the coordination, construction contracts, and financial responsibilities for the development of the Brownfield eligible activity public improvements. Other key provisions of the reimbursement include flexibility for bonds to be issued the city or the MBRA. In any case, bonds will require the full faith and credit pledge of the city, required appro approval of the Act 381 work plan by MDEQ for environmental eligible activities and the Michigan Strategic Fund for non-environmental eligible activities. Priority of the reimbursement for eligible activities as follows. One, city and or MBRA bond payments. Two, MBRA administrative and operating costs. Three, local site remediation fund. Four, city developer and the MBRA non-bonded expenses and pro rata share. The responsibilities for financing eligible activities are identified in Exhibit C. The reimbursement agreement has been reviewed by the city <coughs> attorney and approve an executed reimbursement agreement must be submitted with Act 381 work plan, which will be delivered to the Michigan Strategic Fund for consideration of state 
tax capture. The MVRA board approved this, the agreement at the November 20th, 2014 meeting. Fiscal effect as detailed in the reimbursement agreement. Recommendation, authorize the mayor to sign the reimbursement agreement between the MVRA and DLP Market General Hospital, LLC, for the DLP Market General Replacement Hospital project with approval as to substance by the city manager and as to form by the city attorney. Alternatives as determined by the commission. Thank you. Uh, we have two people who wish to speak. Mr. Uh, Cambenzi, would you like to come forward? Bob Kimbenzi, 306 North 6th Street, City of Marquette. <clears throat> um, I guess my real questions with this probably go right back to the planning process, which um, I think the Memorandum of Understanding came out, and it was a it certainly looked like it was Duke's plan. There were a number of items in there that a number of us questioned, uh, especially that had to do with construction off-site. Um, What's happened to the planning process? This isn't a typical planning process of any project. This is a huge project. The cart's before the horse, apparently. It really seems like the cart is before the horse. Um, is this whole plan going to be ready to go, basically, before we have any public forums? It almost seems that way. Out of the public forums come some ideas. Maybe the plan doesn't get changed much, but maybe the plan needs to be changed substantially. If you look back at the previous item, item number six, the uh, contract to design a $1 million marina building. We will have three public forums during the design process for a $1 million building. This is a, what, almost $200 million project? No design forms yet. Commissioner Conley, you made a comment. The voters feel like the project's moving forward without their input. What does this hospital project look like? The only input the people could have is if they come to this podium and stand here and say something. A number of you said we're going to have public forums two months ago. When? Mr. Verito. Please start Thank speaking. Excuse me. Frank Jeff Barrett, 350 East Ridge Marquette. These are my opinions. Your reimbursement agreement would be fine and dandy had you not neglected to give us a hint as to where the service center will go or what use the existing campus will see. Your agreement calls for the relocation of the service center and associated infrastructure, but as in the case of the boathouse, you're rushing ahead without knowledge of the integral components to your proposal. We're much too far along in the process for you to have not come up with several acres of unsloped and unwooded land for a centrally located service center. <coughs> your continued ignorance of the concern is perhaps caused by the Brownfield Authority's tight schedule to submit the state documentation by tomorrow of all days. Why is it so important for the authority to obtain 50% of the value for the service center relocation when the hospital has already allocated $18.2 million for the move? A lot of your rush hinges on this relocation, yet none of you will even mention a single prospective site for the new center. Yes, we want to obtain the state funds that we're entitled to, and we don't wish to lose a construction season. But why not let the wealthy hospital pay so the brownfield funds can be allocated to another site, such as Cliffs Dow or the Boulevard relocation? Badly as we could use a new hospital, the lack of public participation in a city of 22,000 is almost beyond belief a real indication that our residents have given up on this board, much because the hospital relocation, like the boathouse and your other land use decisions, is based on the prevailing politics. Okay. Um, is there a motion to um, dispense with the rules and have some discussion? Commissioner, pardon me. Commissioner Reynolds. That's what I was going to do. I was going to move to suspend the rules for discussion. Or support to that. Okay. Any discussion on that? No. <laughs> no. 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 Okay. All those in favor, please say yes. 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 
proposed. Okay, that passes. So we are open for discussion. Now, I would like to comment on a couple things. We have uh, Mac McClellan here, who is the consultant for the Brownfield, uh, who is who drove here this evening from Traverse City, I believe, to get here so he could do the same fine job he did describing this at our last work session, which was last Thursday, which everyone walked away from saying, we now get this and understand it. So really appreciate your comments, and we'll call on you in just a moment. Um, I'd like to open the discussion with uh, a statement, if I could ask the city manager to kind of get us up to date as to what hap has happened and uh, perhaps dismiss some of the, or not dismiss, uh, <coughs> what has happened. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, I, I appreciate that uh, tee up. Uh, again, we do have the Brownfield Authority here. We have DLP here. Uh, last Thursday, uh, the City Commission conducted a work session. Uh, to review the reimbursement agreement. And again, uh, the reason why the reimbursement agreement is important is because it's part of what the Brownfield has to submit to the state for the Act 3D1 uh, process. And I had a chance to discuss this with some members of the public the other day. And uh, I'm sensitive to the comments on the, the public hearings, but we're really not at a point yet where uh, we're we're ready to kick off a planning process per se, like what's being described, or I think what, what the expectations are. Uh, we're really more in a mortgage process right now. Uh, a lot of the discussion that we talked about last Thursday, a lot of what you're gonna hear, I know again from the, from the Brownfield Authority, really speak to getting the financing agreements in place and getting the project management payments in place bef that are required wherever and whatever we end up building for the replacement service center and to accommodate the needs of DLP. So, uh, we're, we're eminently getting ready to come forward with our first public process, which is discussion of available sites in the city. Uh, that's not something we're going to discuss here, but I wanted to, to make sure I shared that publicly before we move forward. I'd like to also note, and I, I might ask Ron if I get this wrong, uh, we had published this uh, agenda cover last Friday to make sure that we're complying with the open meeting agreement. Uh, we've had discussion with the Brownfield Authority and with DLP uh, city staff uh, through the course of the weekend because uh, we recognized there were some uh, uh, typos, there were some still uh, slightly differing views of what uh, both parties wanted to see that uh, see in the agreement. Uh, I'm happy to say that as of this morning, we had found uh, agreement on all the big items that you're going to that you're going to hear, uh, leading up to signature by both DLP and the Brownfield Authority. Uh, but in terms of what was described in the cover, uh, it's a little bit different. Um, for example. Uh, we won't be talking about the tax abatement uh, this evening. Uh, that changed a little bit in form, although uh, um, I know Mac might mention explicitly how. We have staff here to talk about some of the nuances and some of the other language, some of the differences from what the commission saw on Thursday night. And uh, Ron, did you want to add anything? The only thing I would add is, as Bill said, negotiations continued throughout the weekend up late into Sunday and really finished up probably close to noon today. So the document looks a little different than you than you saw it the first time. Um, and so the cover letter is a little different than what you're going to see. But Max here to explain what those changes were and why. But it was a negotiated agreement and we got it uh, done. Uh, I am. Thank you. Uh, just a comment. Uh, Mr. Banos is here. Um, is available to participate in the discussion that you have questions. Uh, also, the Chief Financial Officer, Tom Butler, is watching us on television. So uh, he is getting the folks that you see as in because we try to get here to Nashville and just try to put it by four minutes.
Thank you, sir. I wanted to uh, point out for the commission members and for the uh, viewing public, uh, the documents that we have here at the DS reflect the uh, document, the red line changes that you'd seen before, uh, the clean copy that's been signed off by Duke Life Point and the Brownfield Authority, and then uh, a short list of the uh, differences between the two documents that the Brownfield and Mac prepared uh, for the city commission earlier. And those have been given to the clerk, and of course they'll be part of the public package as, as uh, published. Uh, but if there aren't any other for, I can only see a few feet in front of me there. So. He just wrote like a note. My pleasure. Thank you. After just a brief discussion over the last three days or so, <laughs> um, we've had, uh, and I think part of the, the situation, a couple of things I want to say is I think to follow up on the city manager's comment, this is um, qualifying for a mortgage. Basically, we're qualifying for a state grant, in essence, is what a lot of this work uh, is for. And so it's very preliminary. All the plans, all the other work is happening. Part of this, we identified a development agreement needs to be um, negotiated between the city and DLP as all of that development work happens. It's still very in the preliminary stage of the physical development of the project, but this is very much important early on to make sure that the finances are in place that, that the project can actually proceed. So that's really what we're doing is pre-qualifying for a, a state grant and, and the capture of local taxes as well. Um, on your desk is a markup copy, and, and what we tried to do was there are a number of smaller changes. Um, uh, one attorney liked the agreement instead of this agreement, so that was all kind of changed throughout. So, But uh, when you have a lot of cooks um, making the broth there, there's lots of comments about that. So, But um, we provided what, what I believe to be the substantive changes from the document that, you had, that we had gone through on Thursday night, uh, and if it's appropriate, I'll go through those changes. Um, the first change is I had included um, the parent company, LifePoint Hospitals, uh, in the agreement, and the primary purpose for that was to address the financial assurance mechanisms. Uh, there's, you know, the clawback provisions and, and other factors involved in the city bonding, wanted to make certain that the project was viable, financially viable. Um, the uh, um, LifePoint officials explained to us that that would be a whole other approval pro pro process with a whole other corporation and then talked about uh, the opportunities to provide those financial assurances. And later in the document, there is an agreement to provide financial commitments for the document in a form approved by both by all parties. Um, so we won't be able to move forward until we receive those financial assurances. But uh, that, uh, as a result, uh, LifePoint uh, Healthcare is, is not included as a signatory, and that was the primary reason for including them as a financial assurance, as we were able to address that issue in another way. Uh, on page three, under definitions K, again, LifePoint Hospitals is not included as a developer. The developer is a DLP Market General Hospital, LLC. And the next change is back on page 12. Again, this is a provision where we had typically provided a, a bank commitment letter. Uh, they'll be financing the, uh, um, the uh, project through uh, arrangements with the parent company, so the parent company will be involved uh, in this arrangement as well. And this is the area where they'll need to provide that, that documentation of financial commitment, and all parties will have to agree to that. So it'll be a subsequent documentation that all parties would agree to, uh, or, or we don't move forward. And I'm happy to answer any questions as, uh, as they come about. On page 14, uh, A, um, because typically what we ask for is um, invoices submitted within six months of the eligible activities being conducted. In some projects I've been involved with, people come back three or four years later after everybody's forgotten what was supposed to happen, and, and now we don't know what, what the actual expenses and what the actual costs were. In this project, it'll be a two to 
three-year construction phase. They'll be in a whole lot of phases. And uh, they'll be submitting invoices on a regular basis, but we kind of accomplished that purpose of making sure that there was an end date upon which they'd submit invoices. And the recommendation, the conclusion was it would be two years after they were able to accept patients, basically their occupancy. So for a two-year period, they may clean up some of the final billings. They may be able to do that. But after, after two years, they're no longer able to submit invoices for consideration of reimbursement uh, at that time. Typically, it's been six months on smaller projects. Obviously, this is a little bit different. That's the basis of that change. Uh, and again, uh, down at the bottom, that was also mentioned there, the 180 days changed to 24 months to uh, accept um, uh, patients. And um, they can submit a reimbursement requests at any time that they wish. Um, item uh, D on 15 is the we don't trust MAC clause there. So if there's a dispute over what I recommend for the, um, uh, for the invoice approval, uh, there's a process laid out of an independent individual uh, that all parties would agree upon based on and would evaluate whether that activity is eligible under the Brownfield Act or not. If we, all, if we can't agree on one person, everybody gets three people. And if two of them agree that it is, then it is. If two of them say that it's not, it's not. So it's a little bit of a specialized process. It doesn't go to mediation where you'd have a mediator who's not familiar with these activities. It talks about hiring somebody like me uh, to, to independently evaluate that, that opinion. So I won't put that title in there, the don't trust me clause. But that's a, that's a very reasonable process. And, and the Brownfield attorney for DLP and myself, we've never had, and in, in, I've been doing this since 97, we've never had a process where there's been an invoice agreement. It's pretty straightforward and understandable. The next change is uh, back on page 21. And uh, the, the essence to this uh, component, the reason that it's included, is that the Brownfield Authority uh, it approves the invoices up front. They capture funds and then reimburse those to whoever made those expenses uh, at, the, at the point in time. Um, what we don't want to have is, an unknown, unbeknownst to us, Somebody buys that obligation or pays somebody the money for that TIF, the original developer, and then we continue to pay the developer, and then the new per party comes back and says, hey, I paid for those. You owe me that money. We don't want to be involved in two parties that we have to pay. So um, in the original information, and Ron mentioned this, he likes this better, as we all do, that the MBRA would uh, approve it, uh, but uh, such approval would not be unreasonably withheld. Um, the other party always likes it that we'll just let you know. Um, we really don't care. There's no approval. We just want to make certain that we avoid that situation, that it's only pay we're only paying one person. So as long as they notify us of that assignment, um, then uh, we'll make that change. We also did include, they said, um, uh, and this is kind of a final change this morning, was that they said they'd notify us within 30 days of the effective date of the assignment. We were concerned that if the effective date was October 1st and we made a payment October 15th, uh, then that would that would be a problem or a matter of dispute between the two parties and us. So we just said they have to provide us with that notification prior to or no later than the effective date. You know, a lot of this is esoterica, but um, uh, it's, uh, it was important to uh, to go through. And those are the primary changes from the document that you received um, you. previously. Thank you. Um, would you just stay there? Um, uh, commissioners, uh, first of all, I appreciate, again, your coming and explaining that. And um, for some reason, that's just more easily understood hearing it rather than reading it and trying to stay <laughs> I awake. Can, I can appreciate uh, that. Or realizing I don't understand it. Um, I have to, before we open this for discussion, Commissioner Connolly sent me a little note, and he wants to say something uh, before we discuss. Uh, before I participate in the discussion, I need to disclose that I have been an employee of Market General Hospital, an irregular part-time employee, where I was helping establish a new physician here in town. I haven't worked for them for six months, and I don't anticipate continuing. But I will actually get a tax form from them in this calendar year. Um, could we ask the uh, city attorney, is that reason to recuse himself? Uh, Your Honor, I've talked to Commissioner Connolly, and we've been through this scenario. He's not an officer director. 
uh, shareholder or employee of Market General or DLP. He did some sporadic part-time work six months ago. He absolutely has no conflict of interest, and he's required by this charter of ours to vote when this issue comes up. Thank you. I appreciate you, however, being transparent with that. You have a ruling from the city attorney. Now, finally, uh, let's open it to discussion. Or uh, anyone have any? Commissioner Reynolds. I just have one question. I'm going to have more things probably to say in a bit. But in the we don't trust Matt clause, <laughs> just because I didn't understand it either, I put honk next to it. Um, my only question is if for some reason there isn't an agreement upon what you say in the we come up with that panel, um, who pays for those consultants? Is that part of the Brownfields or Wood Marquette and DLP? You know, that's a good question. It's not explicitly authorized, but I presume that the parties would pay for their own consultants. Okay. Or split the, con the independent consultants. Okay. Any further comments? Commissioner Connolly. Uh, Mac, could you? I'm simple here. So, could you explain the guarantee about you know we, the difference between Life Point and Duke Life Point, and there was a guarantee, and we, why was the change, and what guarantee do we have? And did I hear you correctly that if that part of it isn't resolved uh, to everybody's satisfaction, that just the deal goes away? Well, we would have to have in that the one clause that's included in there that a f financial commitment satisfactory to all parties would need to be executed. So there'd need to be documentation that would have to be provided by DLP that would satisfy the city and the Brownfield Authority that there is financial commitment to proceed with the project and also financial resources to uh, uh, cover any of the clawback provisions, uh, either if there is not enough TIF funds to cover the $20 million of bond issue or if it's converted to a 501c3 tax exempt entity, the MOU uh, and, and this agreement requires them to pay off those bonds. So, is this guarantee like a letter of credit, or uh, how is that? It may be a letter of credit. It may be an assurance. It may be assets that uh, uh, that uh, DLP or another party backs up uh, for them. That uh, is either in cash or some other liquid asset. Could be a guarantee of the. Property. I'll look to Ron for any other kind of guarantees, but there, there could be any number of techniques uh, to back that up. Ron? Yeah. So I think Mac hit most of them. I mean, there's bonding. There's, there's a number of different things that can be done, but that is not something that we did in this agreement. Um, I mean, I think that's, as Mac said earlier, that's a stage away we're moving on to some other agreements, the purchase agreement, the development agreement, and some other things. So for purposes of this agreement, I mean, you had the discussions with DLP. You were comfortable moving in this direction. And Yeah, there is a requirement in here that says they have to provide a financial commitment. So, you know, that is really part of this agreement. They have to provide that financial commitment, and we'll have to deal with that. You know, when it comes, that's going to be a matter of negotiations. But the city and the Brownfield Authority will have to be satisfied with that with that financial commitment in order to proceed with all of the rest of the projects. Right, Mr. Manager. Thank you, Your Honor. This actually took a fair amount of time uh, compared to how we're discussing it, and we appreciate DLP's uh, thoughtful approach to this. It's most closely analogous when you've heard us speak to we pledge our full faith and credit. Uh, the Brownfield can bond, the city of Marquette can bond, uh, but ultimately it's making sure that if those debts come due that the revenue is there to pay for it. Uh, in the case with DLP, uh, DLP and LifePoint are two separate companies, and DLP has only been around uh, for a short while and has fewer assets and less established credit and therefore is on the surface a little bit uh, riskier when you look at what the brownfield might like to do with public debt obligations. And so how how that full faith and credit issue is resolved was subject both to just the basic consideration <coughs> of the different related business entities, different kinds of structures that could come into effect that the city may at that time accept or might be willing to negotiate over. Now, ultimately, it also played back to things in the post-implementation agreement that the that the state attorney general approved. Uh, there's a 10-year period of time where Duke Life Point can't do anything to change the the structure of the deal or their commitments. 
And so if, for example, there's a $20 million clawback proviso and it's a straight line debt that goes against that, um, you could imagine in 10 years it's half of that, it's $10 million. So at that point in time, if they chose to uh, sell to a, a, a 501c3 or or close the hospital or tear it down or create some other situation where we couldn't collect tax revenue against it, we'd still owe 10 years of bonds, but we wouldn't have any tax revenue against it. And so how we put in place the mitigating financial agreement to make sure that uh, the city's held harmless, the public is held harmless, the brownfield is held harmless is, the, is really the crux of what we were trying to get to. We couldn't get to a firm fixed idea that could be encoded in this agreement, but we do have it as a, a condition precedent to uh, satisfying any of the future agreements that Mac identified here a moment ago. And we're confident because there are so many different ways we might be able to solve that, that we'll find something that'll satisfy uh, the city and our potential uh, uh, bond uh, agents' requirements for assurance. Okay, thank you. Any further comments from commissioners? Commissioner Cambenzi? Well, I guess I just would like to discuss my feelings about the reimbursement agreement and going forward with this. Um, to the community, I received this revised agreement at 3.16 p.m. today, and I have not had a chance to look at it. Um, I haven't had time to read it, formulate questions, or ask questions. Um, so going through it up here doesn't do me any good. I guess it, it makes me more uneasy. The second point I'd like to make is I do not know the current value of the existing site that the service center sits on. I don't know what that building's worth. I don't know what the land is worth. I don't know how much we are giving away. There's a $2 million purchase price um, that the city has agreed to pay, or except for the payment of the bond, okay? So before we enter into an agreement, it's my understanding those bonds have to be paid off. It's outstanding debt. I do not know how much our service center is worth. And when I get that question asked to me in public, it makes me extremely uncomfortable because I don't know what we're giving away. I think the third thing is, I think we need to know right now where the location of the service center is. I'm not sure why that's not part of an open discussion. But I can tell you I'm extremely frustrated that we don't have information going forward with this. Um, as a commissioner, I. I feel like I have hardly any information on what's happening with staff. Um, and again, just to go over an update from two, two weeks ago, we had a staff report that went out to about uh, 50 staff. They're called weekly departmental reports. And our community development reported that there was a meeting with MDOT to discuss uh, the roundabout and overpass. Um, I had some questions on this, some financials, some What's the scope of the project? Uh, how do you deal with an overpass on 7th Street when there's property basically immediately in the right of way of anything you would need to do here? What is that? What's the cost? What does that look like? Um, and when I asked the mayor if it was uh, responsible to get information, more information on this, um, because it came out in a departmental report to us, um, I was told it wasn't important and it'll come to us when staff is ready. Uh, that was not good enough for me. I think it's important when commissioners have questions on project of this magnitude that we get them answered. And so I emailed my questions to Dennis. And I just got a response today at probably about 3 p.m. So in the meantime, a new policy was implemented to make sure that whenever staff uh, is contacted by a commissioner that they report it right away. But in the meantime, my questions weren't being answered. So I went to MDOT myself, and I had a great discussion with the engineers there, and the mayor's shaking his head at me because I'm sure he's mad. But I have every right to get this information. I should not have to go elsewhere to get it. What I learned about <clears throat> in putting an overpass was the possibility of how much land is needed for a project that size. It's not state standards, it's federal highway standards. The right-of-way needed. There's a lot of unanswered questions that can considerably drive up a project. So now I'm worried about the amount that we put in 
a memorandum of understanding to cover projects like this for this hospital to go through. So the fourth point I'd like to make and why I'm uncomfortable is I think the city commissioners need to come up with a not to exceed cost on our end of this project. We relocate the hospital, but at what cost? At what cost is it worth it to us? Is it worth it for the community? I don't have that answer. Lastly, there were two things from last Thursday's uh, meeting with the Brownfield that considerably bothered me. One was that the time is right to strike, that it's imperative that we get this request in by tomorrow. I'm not sure why. So I started researching. And I came up with a report from the Office of the Auditor General in Michigan. Going back since 2011, and it's a performance audit report for the Brownfield Redevelopment Financing Program for the state that reports that the Department of Treasury did not compile and analyze the tax incremental financing information and report it to the legislature. This has been, I believe, the last three years. It also stated that 72.4% of Brownfields, those that received Brownfield money, not all that applied, not all the Brownfields out there, but 72.4% of Brownfields in the 2013 fiscal year did not report the following seven statutory requirements to the Department of Tre Treasury or the legislature. And those requirements are the amount and source of tax increment revenues received from brownfield projects, the amount and purpose of expenditures of tax incremental revenues, the amount of principal and interest on all outstanding indebtedness, the initial taxable value of all eligible property subject to the brownfield plan. And I would say that our service center isn't taxable, but I have no idea what the value of it is. The captured taxable value realized by the Brownfield Redeve Redevelopment Authorities. Number six, information concerning any transfer of ownership or interest in eligible property. And number seven is the amount of tax increment revenues attributable to taxes levied for school operating purposes. So when I look at all of this and I look for some examples out there uh, that would make me feel more reassured going into a $20 million plus project on the city's part for a brownfield. I'm a little uneasy. And at this point, it would be my recommendation that we slow down, that we don't try and get this reimbursement agreement in because there's going to be a major change in this department at the state level. I think that's extremely irresponsible. And if other commissioners feel Better, I guess I'd like to hear their answers, but for those reasons, I cannot support submitting this document. I think there's a lot more information we need out there. Thank you. Mr. Campana. Uh, Commissioner Campanzi, I respect what you say. I respect your opinions for the most part. Um, personally, I think that we have to do this. We have to get it going. This is... Um, a massive and complex project that we got ahead of us. It's going to take time, and we have to get it going. Otherwise, it's going to be a 10-year project. Um, personally, I trust the city manager and the city, uh, the staff. I think that they're professionals. I think they're competent. I think they can do the job. They can do the job where I can't. I'm not going to be looking over their shoulder. I think that with, they're doing a very good job moving this along, and I, I don't want to say what they say. I'll accept, but you almost have to. I mean, we'll watch them, but, but they're doing their job, and they're doing a good job. Um, the mayor doesn't get mad. I mean, he does not get mad and criticize people. Uh, I, I, I don't think that was necessary. I think he keeps, he's pretty calm in all cases. Thank you. Uh, Mac, you have raised your hand. Yeah, I just have one point on, on the reporting with Commissioner Combensi. Um, I'm proud to report that the Market Brownfield Redevelopment Authority has complied with the Treasury reporting ever in, in every year since it started uh, working with Sherry and Diana and providing that Treasury report. And there were significant changes in the reporting act just for those problems. 
uh, in a recent amendment uh, in 2012. This was the first year for that reporting as well. So now the reports go to uh, MEDC on behalf of, ME, uh, of that, and, and uh, the MBRA complied with that reporting as well. It's a much better system uh, that they have in place now. So just want to Thank you. That. Any other remarks? Um, Commissioner Connolly. Well, <clears throat> I think for this whole thing to, to move on, as we agreed in August, the next step is to secure the brownfield funding. We can't start devoting time, money, resources in relocating the service center if we don't know whether the deal is going to go through. If the state rejects this brownfield money, this deal is done. Uh, it's based on that. So we can't take the next step. We, the next logical step is getting the financing, and then we'll, we'll go back and look at the practical problems of the service center, the uh, transportation access, et cetera. So we have to do this, and we have to do this to be a responsible partner and live up to the agreement that this commission made four months ago. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Baldini. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, uh, Mac, thank you for your comments. Just because the state's not collecting data does not mean that we're not going to supply our data and abide by the law. I, I think one of the things we have to be careful as we proceed or cautious about as we proceed through this for the next year, year and a half, two years, three years, is that we, we don't begin mixing up a, a lot of things. There are steps and phases. In other words, we're not going to sign this agreement until we know absolutely everything about where this is going to go, where I've heard how the hospital is going to be sited on the property, um, all those things. Uh, then we probably will never have an agreement, or if we do, it'll be six or seven years before we ever get there. It's uh, some of us who've gone through other construction projects at universities or schools or something, you proceed. There's a stage. There's a process. You go out. You issue bonds. You get money. Now we got money. Let's hire an architect. Uh, let's design. Uh, let's move forward. And um, I, I checked this over, and I compliment the group that did the negotiation. They lost their weekend, but there are not that many changes from the previous document, but some rather substantial ones. Um, and I think we have to get the agreement from the state, the Brownfield, to know that we have the money. Uh, that's going to give us a lot more freedom to move forward. Uh, not all of the community involvement, I believe, rests with us. I think as we move forward with, or as the hospital moves forward, I think they have an obligation to hold maybe some community meetings. We're not building the hospital. We're providing the property. They have that responsibility. And I, I, I would assume they've done this elsewhere and they know how to probably do some of that. Um, I also, building roads is always a contentious thing. I think when we built the roundabout, if you recall, um, we didn't. The state built one and there were a lot of hearings and people had a lot of questions. Uh, change in behavior, change in location of things is going to be a challenge for our community. And, and I think we as a community have to understand this is, a, this is a major thing for us. It's an exciting thing for us, but it's going to require a number of steps. You are not going to put in place every, every piece of it before we proceed. This is one very significant piece. Um, and it says, you got money. We will have letters that Mac has indicated, <coughs> agreement letters, guarantees that there's funding someplace in some bank, whatever. Uh, and that happens And that negotiations. Our attorney will take care of that and has done that in probably a number of projects. I think we have to do this. We have to move forward. Um, and this is just one piece, and this is one of many meetings we're going to have to discuss this and the people showing here. And I suspect you'll be back again, Mac. Okay. I hope so. I hope you'll <laughs> so, have me. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm going to support it and I because I think we have to go forward with it. Commissioner Reynolds. Um, my only comments are I do agree with Commissioner um, Baldini, and um, he summed it up very beautifully. 
And for me, I work full time, just like Sarah. And it's very difficult when you do get this at three o'clock. And I was beyond frustrated with that part. But that being said, you guys worked so hard over the weekend and so diligently and so wonderfully that this was a lot of work you guys put into this. And I know that we need to do this in order to even go anywhere further. So for that reason, I will be voting yes on it. Um, but I really do hate last minute stuff, but thank you for coming all the way up for it. And thank you for working so hard, Sherry. I really appreciate it. Any other comments? Commissioner Campana. Oh, no, Commissioner Frazier. No, Commissioner Frazier. He, 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 he talked before you did, so. My only comment is um, thanks to the staff for working so hard on this, but um, I think this just helps you know, reimburses that we're the citizens of Marquette are not going to get stuck with the bill to move this the center. I think maybe I'm misunderstanding it, but it basically helps confirm that. I think that what a lot of citizens are worried about is, you know, we're all as commissioners, but we're all as city taxpayers too. That they don't get the citizens don't get stuck with the bill to move this thing. That DLP pays for it, or Brownfield pays for it, or something happens. So I think this agreement will help you know, move that situation forward. I think this should reassure citizens that they're not getting stuck at the bill. So I guess that's my only comment. Thank you. Uh, I would like to make a couple remarks. Um, <clears throat> I think the reason why both Duke Life Point and the city spent essentially all weekend working on this was because they're both very committed to this happening. It isn't just the city ramming it down Duke Life Point's throat or Life Point ramming it down the city's point. The memorandum of understanding was not just Duke Life Point's idea. It was based on a lot of hard work and a negotiated process. And the bottom line is because of all that, the, if you don't have the Brownfield Agreement, this is not going to happen. It's not affordable to the hospital, period. So this is why we do not have the cart before the horse. That's just not right. We have to do this. And I'd like to ask Mac a question. We have all these different things, which one commissioner is objecting to, or, and her father is saying we should slow down. We have public forums, blah, blah, blah. The point is, it, we can't put much else in this after this is approved, if it is approved. We can take stuff out if it doesn't work. Is that a fair statement? Uh, without amending, we can't put theory? stuff We can't put stuff in without amending and go, going all through this, but we can always take stuff out without amending if we find that this is the 7th Street isn't just going to work. It's out. That's correct. That's why we need this right now. We don't need to do all that planning now and then find out three months later, it's not going to work. It, it um, enables that to happen and provides the funding source for it. Right. The decision for that to move forward is based on the, the project itself. Okay. Thank you. With that, I'm going to call the question. Uh, a motion. Make a, a call for someone to make a motion. Commissioner Baldini. I uh, would move that we authorize the mayor to sign the reimbursement agreement between the uh, uh, MBRA, which is the uh, Market Board of uh, re the Reimbursement Agreement, and the DLP Marquette General Hospital, LLC, for the DLP Marquette General Replacement Hospital <coughs> Project, with the approval as to substance by the city manager and as to form by the city attorney. Support, uh, Support for that motion. Commissioner Connolly. All right. Any further discussion? Commissioner Cambanzi. I'd just like to thank staff publicly for all their work. I know they worked hard on this all weekend. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those then in favor of the motion authorizing the mayor to sign the reimbursement agreement between the MBRA and the DLP Market General Hospital LLC for the DLP Market General Replacement Hospital project with approval as to substance by the city manager and as to form by the city attorney. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed? No. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, that passes six to one uh, with Commissioner Cambenzi uh, voting no. Uh, the next item, and thank you all for your hard work over the weekend as well as for a long time getting this thing together and appreciate all of your efforts and Thanks again, all of you, to the staff. The next item is, I just wrote down, Lakeshore. So uh, would someone like to make a motion about whatever Lakeshore is about? It's about the opening the 
uh, uh, bike path and running path. Commissioner Campanzi. Oh, excuse me, Commissioner Campana. No, you had your convener. I would like to make the motion that we seek to open up and plow the bike path along the closed portion of Lakeshore Boulevard so that it may be used by runners, walkers, bikers, joggers. Okay, is there a support to that? No support. Okay, would you like to? I'll support it. Oh, excuse me. Supported by Commissioner Connolly. Okay. Commissioner Campana. Uh, I've been out there this weekend to look at the bike path. Um, I, before I say yes or no or what I want, I, I will agree to whatever staff says about it. I mean, they are the professionals. If they think that there's a problem with people with plowing the, the bike path, and it can't be done and shouldn't be done for safety reasons or whatever, I will agree, with, I will go with what they say. If it could be plowed and kept open, it would definitely be a benefit to the citizens of Marquette because when I was there, there were people walking on it and there was actually people running on it. And I just happened to be there at that time. And I'm, as a f former runner, that was a very popular path. I mean, that is that is a route that lots of people use bikers walkers runners um, it's an important part and I, I know it's just a short section but as mrs. Vandenen says uh, to use another section of town of route is is not as safe it's, it's actually dangerous and um, so I think for a safety factor that's very important it'd be nice to have it open I would like to hear from staff as I'm sure they have comments on it but but I'm for it. Would you direct a question? Could I ask the staff? The city manager. What is your opinion on this? Thank you, Your Honor. Well, uh, we weren't prepared to speak to this item this evening. Uh, we'd be glad to come back with a full answer. Uh, and if the commission would entertain the opportunity for staff to go back and put together a, a statement of exactly what the cost and the consequences of opening Lakeshore would be, we'd be glad to return that to the City Commission as promptly as possible. Anything further? Nothing Commissioner Connolly? Well, I supported the motion for the discussion, and uh, I, I didn't know about it either. Um, you had brought something out about uh, an attractive nuisance and referred us to a source that said that it attracts it's a danger to people who are under 18 uh, and that was the reference we got in a, a question about that and if that's an attractive, attractive nuisance is the RDOC an attractive nuisance under that same uh, uh, same viewing uh, thank you I, I'd be glad to pass the that discussion over to Dennis, Dennis? Well, Mr. Stack on, on a, attractive nuisance Dennis Sure. Uh, generally, it, when you speak in terms of attractive nuisance, you're looking at knowingly placing the public in harm's way. We deal with several different attractive nuisances, public and private, in the community at this time. One that comes to mind is the orphanage. We go out there on a somewhat regular basis and conduct inspections, and if it's open, <coughs> we board it up and we send the property owner a bill because it's considered an attractive nuisance. Look, I can go in there and I can have fun. That in itself is considered, you know, what Kyle passed along for people under 18. It looks attractive to them and they want to go in there. In this case, you know, when we made the decision to close the road, we had debris uh, that was strewn across the pathway. We've got undermining of infrastructure and all of that's hidden under snow. If you leave that open, you're essentially creating an attractive nuisance because you're telling the community it's okay to go there, and then they could conceivably get hurt or cause harm to themselves. So we didn't want to you know, put it in that situation. So those are two examples of that term. Uh, may I ask, is the, is the bike path being undermined? Yes, it is currently being undermined. Such that it wouldn't support the weight of a stroller? 
you know, I, I, only thing I can speak to at this time is correspondent that I have from uh, Superintendent Scott Kimbenzi um, saying that the edge was not well supported and there's slight drop-offs at the edge of the path. Placing heavy equipment on the bike path for clearing would likely damage the edge of the path as it would the road. So, but again, as city manager said, that's probably something we need to go back and take a look at. Yeah. Mr. Manager. Thank you. I don't want to clarify it. It's not so much only the weight of of use on the road, but there are standards uh, for trip hazards also for where, you know, and we typically see it uh, more with sidewalk cracking than we do with things like the bike path. But there's a certain distance that when you start seeing fissures and cracks popping up, uh, that it changes the the safety of the use of that that walkway and it requires us to go out and fix those and of course now is not the construction season where we can go out and do that but it's not just about whether or not people can step out and if the ground will cave in but it's also about in the reverse way the heave action from the from the uh, cracking of the of the pavement as well but again, that's something we'd like time. We have our engineers out there assessing the situation as part of our emergency request to the Army Corps of Engineers. We've taken extensive photographs. Uh, we can share with the commission the current condition of that bike path and come up with a full cost estimate of what it's going to take to open it up and make it available in a safe way for the public. Uh, so and the question is if we, now that we have a, a motion in support, and this is more a point of order. Uh, if we would rather uh, pull back in next year, which is our next meeting, consider this and put it on the agenda for that. What what direction would we take? I can offer some um, direction there. Okay, no, let Mr. Baldini talk. He's been raising his finger for five minutes. So, Commissioner Baldini. Thank you. Uh, a couple of things. I went out there also and visited. And let's face it, the, the weather has been very nice the last couple of days, and the number of people are out there. Um, because I thought this would, this, I saw some of the traffic, the email traffic, and I thought, not a bad idea. Let's open it. Let's let the people uh, go there. I suppose one of the questions, the new, uh, attractive nuisance, is we have a fence that, uh, uh, not a fence, we have a rather significant uh, signage at both ends saying you can't drive your car here and so on and so forth. My thought was, okay, you plow it, you put it in there, then do we have to put a fence along the bike path because will people stroll down to the lake? And I mean, let's face it, when we get storms in this community, one of the great things to do is to go down to the lake and watch a storm. It's one of the strange things that we do, but it's exciting. And so I, I was concerned about that. Uh, and I also was concerned about what would it cost, but we would keep it clear. Uh, so I, I am concerned about the public nuisance issue and uh, or attractive nuisance that we might create. I wish we could open it because I do think it, it is a path it is a way for people to, to get along that section and to block it off. It's not just a simple let's run through the woods. Uh, it's a major uh, detour. And, but, I, but I do think we have to find out what is our legal obligations. Uh, to the point of Commissioner Connolly's, we can table a motion to time certain and if we table it to, we can't just table it forever, that kills it. Uh, you can table it to the next meeting. Um, and I think we're permitted to do that, but we then have to bring it up at the next meeting to deal with it or defeat it today. Yeah. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Attorney. Okay, Your Honor, there's a motion on the table. I don't know that the, the uh, mayor has repeated the motion. So if the maker of the motion wanted to withdraw and the second wanted to withdraw, that would take care of the motion. And then you could order up the study or the report or whatever. I don't think you ever repeated what the motion was to put it before the body. Thank you. Um, I've learned and uh, learning, you know, remedial mayor school that in order for something to really be a motion, I have to say it. Yeah. And so I haven't said it. No, I would <laughs> I haven't. So it's not. You know, even though you had a wonderful motion, it's not really a motion to know I say this is the motion, you're going to vote on it. Um, a question I have of the attorney is a motion to table is not debatable, correct? It's you just vote on it. 
I uh, believe it is not debatable. Once okay. this motion is withdrawn, if you want to, it's really not the table. It's to postpone it to a definite time. Okay. Now, and he, he can, another point I'd like to make, the, the motioners are listening, I hope. They can just withdraw the motion and make another motion. And Correct. I have a suggestion for another motion for you to consider whoever would like to do it. Because if you, if you, uh, postpone it till another meeting, then nothing, you're not given any direction. It'll just, we'll just have the same discussion next meeting. Um, but if you withdrew the motion and said, uh, this is, I'd like to move uh, the, the management, the city manager, look into this, uh, re make a report and recommendation next meeting uh, for the various options, one to open it, one to how much it's going to cost to fix, uh, or what. And that way, then you have not... If you run the risk of defeating this tonight, then you're stuck, and nothing happens, and the runners are stuck there forever until, and you can't vote, you can't bring it up if you vote against it, so, uh, or if you lose, if you're on the losing side. So that's just for your consideration as to what you want to do, and I'm going to sit here until somebody decides <laughs> what, what you want to do. Because, I mean, in fairness, it, it, you don't want to box the people who are concerned into a box where there's no solution. So I'm, I'm listening. Yes, okay. You made the motion. Um, first, I'd like to say, even if that thing never gets open, people are still going to run on it. So, I mean, they are. It's just the way they are. You don't, you know. But, so I think it's a safety factor, um, a convenience factor, but it's also a safety factor. Um, I... Back to the motion, if the city manager is going to study this and bring us some uh, results, some figures or opinions at our next meeting, and it will be an agenda item, I would like to, uh, to uh, recall, rescind. rescind my is, motion. Is that okay with the seconder? Yeah, I, I uh, withdraw my support for the now rescinded motion. Are there any <laughs> other motions that one might think of? <clears throat> I forget what you said. I know. Well, <laughs> We're going to make a motion. <laughs> We're going to. We want them to. Come, we want to have a motion. We want to make. Okay, I want to make a motion to have the city manager look into the feasibility of plowing the uh, bike path on the closed portion of Lakeshore Boulevard and have it be an agenda item for next meeting. Did I say that right? It's up to you. Um, That's what I'm saying. Is there support? Um, it, it would, may I, before I, can I have them fine tune it a little bit more than just plowing, Dave? Um, or do I have to second it and then we discuss it? I think he He's did. still making his motion. If he wants to clarify it, he, he has the floor. Yeah. Who does? He does? Motion maker. Okay. Motion He's maker. asking for some help to... Um... I would like to see the bike path plowed. What more do we need? I'm asking Commissioner Open. Conley. Open the access to the bike path. It is more a, than just plowing. It's a, more than just plowing. It's a little, maybe a little broader than just a snowplow going down. You know, make it available it, for people to use it. That's what I mean. That's what I'm saying. Okay. I would. Why don't you say this all over? Probably. Okay. The motion is: I would like the city manager to look into what it's going to take, if it's feasible, to open up the bike path along Lakeshore Boulevard that's closed, and to have it open and plowed so that it may be used by runners, walkers, bikers. I support that well-spoken motion. <laughs> is, <laughs> okay. is there, do you have any other discussion, Commissioner Campana? I do not. None. Commissioner Baldini. I have a question. <clears throat> Does feasibility mean that the city manager will also provide us with uh, the cost and the yes. potential liability and other advantages or things? I mean, I think that's what we need as a commission, but I'm just asking for a clarification. Thank you. Uh, my, my interpretation, uh, the, w the way I have this written now, Your Honor, is uh, 
uh, direct the city manager to review the feasibility and recommend options for open access and plowing the bike path on Lakeshore Boulevard and schedule for the next agenda. Uh, that would include uh, not only the actual cost of that, but what the impacts would be both for the existing bike path as well as any potential other impact that might come from lost, lost funding of doing that. You know, if we fix an emergency situation, the Army Corps might very well come back and say, well, since it's not an emergency, you don't qualify for any funding. So I'll also include that as a cost and potential consequence, and, and we'll have that included in all the options. Any other discussion? I, I have a comment. I'm not going to vote for it. Okay, because I'm listening to the manager, I mean, to, to the staff say it's not safe. I'm not willing to say I'm not going to listen to them. I'm micromanaging as soon as I do that. We've had our share of micromanagement going on tonight with other issues. I'm not going to vote for it because I'm I, I would surely vote for it if they hadn't said it's an attractive nuisance and it should be closed. If they, said, if they hadn't said that, then I would say, Yippee, I'm voting for it. But the fact that they said that, that concerns me. Now, my I would vote for a different motion if they said uh, to look at it and to see ways of making it not an attractive, and to include making it not an attractive nuisance. As long as it's an attractive nuisance, I'm going to vote against it. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? Can... Um, Commissioner Connolly, would that be a? Would you accept that as part of the motion, Commissioner Campana? I would. Okay. So, uh, this is really nasty, Madam Clerk. Would you repeat the motion as is, with the, uh, with all the addendums and little things on it? <laughs> Um, from what I have after the city manager's recommendation is d further clarification on feasibility, costs, liability, um, and Mayor Coyne's concern of safety. If there's a recommendation um, from staff of finding a way that would be feasible and safe to open it, then it will come back to the commission. Good. Are you happy with that? I'm happy. All right. I'm, I'm going to call for the motion, uh, and I can't believe I can't read that back, but we just heard it, and I would repeat what you just said, what you're going to put in the motion. So all those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for bringing that up, too. Okay. Uh, next, comments from the City Commission. Uh, Bill, Bill, uh, I'm sorry, I over, I forgot, I apologize, I forgot to have you, you wanted to speak on this? Well, I don't know that it was necessary for me to speak on it. Okay. Um, but I tell you what, if I could... Could you come up here? I, I really apologize. I, I wrote that down, and I got so mired up in all these discussions. I, I didn't ask to speak on okay. this issue okay. um, or on this um, item. However, I've been running on that bike path for about 34 years. I've run past cinder blocks and uh, boulders bigger than I can pick up. And right now on that bike pack, there isn't anything larger than a fist-sized rock, and there is no evidence of erosion. It's the, I don't know about tomorrow, but today you can see the edge of the bike path from one end to the other, and there is no evidence of erosion at all. Okay. And I will tell you my, I will tell you, there's a creative nuisance around here, or a attractive nuisance, and I'll tell you what it is. Everybody, almost everybody in this room has one at home. I've got a couple of them, and almost everybody does. And you keep that bike path closed, and you can close off the whole city if you want, and everyone can stay home on that couch. And the oh. result, <laughs> high blood pressure, heart attacks, overweight, <clears throat> diabetes. Now, there is, there is an attractive... Okay, um, thank you. But 
But there's nothing wrong with that bike path. All you okay. need is send a plow on it. Well, I appreciate your comments. We're getting comments that are different, which puts us in a difficult situation. I would love to go down there with them. Okay. See what they're seeing. Well, thank you. Okay, comments from the commission. Commissioner Comenzi. <clears throat> Well, I'd just like to, <clears throat> again, thank staff for all their hard work. Um, I'd like to thank Mr. Sven and Nina for coming down. Um, sometimes the, the easiest things, uh, you know, we do have to think about, I guess, some of the more difficult decisions, um, the reasons why coming from staff. But um, hopefully this conversation isn't done and it's just not a no-go. Hopefully we can find some solution. Um, I'm not sure if we have maybe a lighter, um, you know, sidewalk, not necessarily a plow or a plow truck, but um, certainly the ones that go around the neighborhood. Um, so hopefully we can, you know, come back and have a, continue the discussion with a solution that's good for everyone. Um, I'd like to wish everyone a happy holidays, uh, safe travels to those going elsewhere. Um, but before we end the session, I guess I would like to say that I am disappointed in Mr. Coyne and um, I'm offended tonight in some of his comments. We can differ up here, um, but as a woman, uh, some of the jabs in that just, they're unnecessary. So I'd just like to say that I am disappointed um, in his comments. Thank you. Commissioner Frazier. Uh, my only comment is who knew that a bike path conversation would take longer than a hospital conversation. So <laughs> hope staff gets something worked out on. Looks like we get the hospital thing in a way, but hopefully we can get the bike path figured out. So that's my only comment. Thank you. Commissioner Campana. Uh, we had two good presentations tonight, and I'm glad we were able to have them. Um, the bike path, again, I'm, I, I very much will go along with whatever city staff says. I just want them to look at it. And they may have said it's not good, but I really want to hear the official word on that. Um, as a runner, I know that it doesn't take much. It doesn't, you know, the uh, obstacles that are out there are really not, as Bill says, Mr. Fed said. Um, we've run over boulders, trees, twigs upheaved cement, it's really, that's not the problem. We just, we would like it open. Uh, but if they come back and uh, say that we cannot, it's dangerous and it'll affect future funding, I would be against it because we do not want to lose that. Um, I was hoping to ask Mr. Banos if the hospital planned to have some forums, but I didn't get that in. Um, Perhaps that will come up in the future. I'm, I'm sure they are going to do it. Uh, it's all part of the master plan here, but I, uh, the people do want to hear what the hospital plans are and what our plans are. So hopefully there will be some public forums. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Happy, happy holidays. Happy New Year to everybody. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Commissioner Rouse. I don't really have much to add to the discussion tonight. Um, the uh, we won't see you again until next year I suppose so happy holidays on that um, and the only reason that um, I also agree with the bike path discussion because I didn't have the opportunity to go down there today because I started getting the stream of emails and I had all this stuff to read on Market General so I am going to go down there this week and take a rundown from my house and see what it's like so I will do that myself um, and I hope we can come up with a solution for you guys too because I'm a runner too just not in the winter time my running is much less so um, that is all Thank you. Commissioner Baldini. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I also want to thank staff for the, the time putting into this uh, document. And, it, and there's going to be other occasions like this as the couple of years go on. Uh, I, I think one of the things that there's a vacuum that's existing out there with regards to the hospital. And I think vacuums get filled with a lot of misinformation. And I think the sooner the hospital fills some of that vacuum, the better off we are going to be as a community. And this is not something I haven't shared with some other folks. And also at the same time, probably we can now begin to move forward with the Brownfield proposal in. If we get some approval, we can begin doing the same thing. Because uh, I, I think there is a great deal of support in the community 
for the hospital and moving the hospital. Uh, but I think also people do have a lot of questions, and, and I think we all have a responsibility to try and, and fill some of those those questions. Um, I also want to announce that the uh, the Marquette School Foundation is having the third annual holiday homecoming on the 26th of December. We three years ago decided that people come home and it's the day after Christmas and where can I go and see some old friends and so the landmark says ah oh, we'll give you the lobby and uh, so this year we're having our third annual holiday homecoming um, for people in town and for people from Bishop Berga, John D. Pierce and Market High School uh, on the 26th. Um, I also want to uh, wish everybody a happy holiday and we'll see everyone next year officially. Thank you. Commissioner Connolly. Um, a <clears throat> number of people to thank tonight. Thanks, Kurt, for uh, doing a good job in that water membrane contract. <coughs> you saved us hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, and thanks for your experience and uh, your hard work and diligence on that. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Mac McClellan and Sherry Davis, Ed Davey, for uh, your hard work, particularly over the weekend, giving up your weekend for bringing this home and, and making it happen. It is the next step. We had to do it. Thank you, uh, Bill. Uh, and uh, attorney uh, Ron Keefe uh, for his input over the weekend. Uh, this was people's time off, and, and they said this needs to be done, and they did it, and it's for the good of the city, and uh, we all thank you for that. Um, other than that, uh, Happy Hanukkah, which starts at uh, sunset tomorrow. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We'll see you next year. Thank you. Um, just a couple of remarks. Mr. Cambenzi asked two questions, one about the cost taking the – um, or dock down to the water line. I, I'd like to see if we have an answer for him for that, and as well as his suggestion to put the report uh, about the or dock and the video on the website. I would assume that will happen. Uh, so thank you for those suggestions. Uh, regarding uh, Commissioner Kim. Kimbenzi's comment, um, I feel that I can disagree with anybody and call them out on how and give my opinion. I don't think I did that based on a person's sex. Uh, and I think that I, I just don't get that. I, I, I would feel free to criticize anybody, man or woman, according to my opinion. And uh, uh, with another comment, uh, I, I found a book here. Someone gave this to me called Marquette, Michigan, um, published in 1890. Uh, this is from the University of Michigan Library by the Google Project that, that filmed all the books in the Michigan Library. And it is a spectacular book uh, about Marquette in 1890 with lots of pictures of things that you know I didn't even know existed and some that still exist. And I, it's available in the city manager's office if you're a history buff. It's really a great book uh, to look at. With that, Mr. Manager, do you have any comments? Thank you, Your Honor. Well, first to note also that the document itself is uh, available th for a link uh, from the city website. Uh, there's a Google use license, but it, it's been posted and it's available in the news flash section on, on the city website. I want to echo again uh, the Commission's thanks for everybody who worked so hard on the, the uh, DLP negotiations. I know we've got Tom Butler and the team listening in, in in Nashville, and I appreciate Ed being here. And, of course, uh, Mac and Sherry for their wonderful efforts to get us uh, to where we are tonight. It's, uh, I think, been said a few times that it's going to be several years worth of effort, uh, and we always try to pace ourselves in terms of a marathon rather than a sprint. Uh, but this was one of those times when, fortunately, we came together and were able to meet, I know, a very important milestone. Uh, we will have all the ORDOC uh, documents out on the city web as quickly as we can. Uh, there is a video. Uh, GEI said that we can use that not only for the city website but to rebroadcast on our PEG channel, and we'll go ahead and, and do that as well. Uh, wanted to also take the moment. The, it's a standing request by the commission to kind of give an update on where we are with all the different things going on with DLP, and I'm going to actually use this opportunity maybe to, to get Kurt in on some of the dialogue uh, I shared earlier that we're in the process of getting an RFP out uh, that would uh, actually put in place the prime contract for moving the service center. And in parallel to that, uh, we've been reaching out to local jurisdictions, local peers, 
uh, trying to solicit their interest potentially in taking advantage of relocation opportunities when we rebuild the service center uh, in terms of the functional kind of space or the functional requirements they might be able to share in the building like that and save our overall community, our overall taxpayers some money. Uh, we've gotten some early feedback from that uh, and we've also th through uh, Kurt's team uh, created a short list of potential sites. Uh, we've been working that through staff. We're in the process of putting the final touches on that uh, and hopefully that'll be the first thing that rolls out to the community. Uh, we're going to be holding a town hall meeting on that prior to bringing it forward to the city commission so that when we stand before you it will have staff's best thoughts, the community's best thoughts and uh, potentially the status and uh, recommendations that might come from that at that time. Uh, we're not uh, at a point where we have to use that as an exclusive list. It's our draft moving forward to engage the community. Uh, if we need to go back to the drawing board uh, and consider other sites, add other sites, take sites off, that'll be a great time for the community to speak out. Uh, but uh, maybe for the timing of that, to set a proper expectation, I'll ask Kurt to talk about the timelines he's looking at right now. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Bill's correct. Uh, we have been working on since the announcement with the Duke Life Point going to City Marquette. Of course, a big interest, uh, a big uh, challenge is the relocation of the service center. Uh, right away, about a month, two months ago, we did start laying the framework of how we're going to do that in such a uh, short time period. And of course, uh, uh, site location was one of the, the major uh, hurdles. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. So really before we bring it out to the public, we need to really do our homework so that we can answer questions in detail, thoroughly, so that when uh, residents, you know, ask, you know, why didn't you pick this site or that site? Or they may have a new site too. So we really need to do, um, you know, um, you know, thorough um, research on that so we can prevent the most accurate information. Um, we do have a tentative short list of about four or five sites right now. Um, again, we're going to be looking at those a little bit in more depth. Um, there's some uh, issues that we need to deal with, some potential partners on those sites. Um, another thing, too, that uh, uh, we have a request for qualifications based out, um, out on the street right now. Um, they're uh, due on the 19th, and that phase uh, uh, allows us to seek a qualified uh, engineering architect, um, general contractor, um, consultant to uh, take us into the next phase of responding to a, a request for a full proposal. Yeah. Kurt, uh, can I ask you just uh, for clarification for everybody who's listening, uh, the when, are, when is the tentative date that you've picked for that town hall meeting regarding the site discussion? I think we're looking about January 12th. Week. Okay. okay. Second and then, week of January. And then for the down-selected firm, uh, the RFP goes out on the 19th. When are we planning on bringing a recommendation back before the city commission? Uh, that would be January 26th. So, excuse me, Your Honor. So we have for uh, uh, the both meetings in January uh, tentatively uh, recommendations coming forward that we'll have had an opportunity to vet through the public and uh, at least bring back to the commission an idea of of some of our initial thoughts on some of these big issues that to Commissioner Baldini's point were are things that people are filling in the blanks on right now. Uh, but we're moving forward about at the pace we thought we would be. Uh, we're very hopeful that we're going to get some strong participation and get a lot of people coming out and helping us make the best decision. And uh, uh, bring forward at least a robust recommendation or a robust discussion on the outcome of that dialogue with the community in January. And with that, I'd only offer happy holidays to the community and uh, please drive safe and don't become something that we have to read about. Okay, meeting adjourned. Thank you.